Well, good morning, church family, brothers and sisters, friends. Good morning. Good morning. I want to begin today actually with an exciting announcement. As we've studied in the book of Acts, one of the essential, vital parts of being Jesus' people and his church is fellowship, being together, growing together. And with so many new people coming to Community Grace this summer, visiting, and uh, with our small groups and midweek ministries and classes on a well-deserved and needed break, there haven't been a lot of fellowship opportunities. And so I want to thank Jim and Becky Lindhorn especially for overseeing what we're about to launch today, and that is Dinner Eights, an opportunity uh, for fellowship for the rest of the summer, for the three months of the summer. How many people have ever been uh, in a church that does something like Dinner Eights, Supper Club, that kind of thing? All right, yeah, there were some hands raised this morning. Uh, earlier as well. I went to a church years and years ago that they didn't have small groups yet, and this is what they did, and it was really enjoyable. And um, so what it is, and you'll see this in your, in your bulletin, there's a little description that says something like, it's a, it's a potluck-style dinner at a host home, an opportunity to meet with newcomers and long-timers in an informal and relaxed setting. No program, just dinner, hospitality, and some guided conversation and good times with new friends. So we're just going to do this these next three months. It's easy to sign up on our website or the church app. Or if you want to sign up today back at the Connection Center, look for one of these sign-up sheets. And one of these details sheets, because you might be asking, well, what about kids? Are they invited? Absolutely. Uh, what if I would like to host? We hope that you will. Uh, we do need hosts. And how about transportation or food allergies? It's all on the detail sheet, which is online or back at the Connection Center. And I just... I have loved doing this years and years ago, and uh, I just am really eager to find out who we're going to be paired up with uh, in this, uh, this summer. So we're going to do that July, August, and September. It's really easy to sign up. Thank you again, Lindhorn, for overseeing that. We seek to obey every part of God's word. Fellowship is a big part. Now, open your Bibles so, so we can study his word together, another huge part of who we are in Christ. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 14, and if you didn't get a bulletin, raise your hand if you would like one of those to stay up with our announcements, and the sermon notes are in there, of course. If you're grabbing a Bible in the chair in front of you, it's on page 868 to get to Acts chapter 14. We launched last week in chapter 13, whether you were here or not, I'll just tell you, we launched what the rest of the book of Acts is primarily about. Acts 13 through 28, through the end, is primarily now about the ministry of the Apostle Paul and his partners to break down the cultural barriers, to bring the gospel of Jesus to every nation, people group in the world. And it launched last week in chapter 13, and the continuation of the book of Acts continues right on through today with the same mission, same Holy Spirit, same Jesus. And so this is all encaptured in the theme of the book of Acts, which is on the top of your notes. And I'm going to put it on the screen, and it's a good time to review it right now as a church. So let's read this out loud. This is the theme of our history, the book of Acts, but it's still what's going on today by Jesus through each and every one of you if you're one of his believers. So would you read this with me? Theme of Acts. The ongoing ministry of the ascended Christ Jesus that he continues through his Holy Spirit empowered witnesses his church. That is us. And we're studying our history so that we can know our present and our future and so much of the wisdom of God. Let's encourage each other today and be strengthened by his spirit through his word. The first Gentile church, the Antioch church, in the last chapter, sent out the first two missionaries, Barnabas and Saul, onto the first mission trip. And the first three stops, we looked at last week, the island of Cyprus, and then Perga, and then Pisidian Antioch. We learned at all three stops the importance of standing strong for truth. We're going now, as we get into verse uh, chapter 14, we're going to continue that look at standing strong for truth truth, but it's going to have some new twists and lessons for us today for our own journeys in Christ. Also noteworthy, last week was the leadership change from Barnabas to Saul, who from chapter 13 from now on 
will be called by his Greek name, Paul, the Apostle Paul. Paul's first, first missionary journey was with Barnabas, and it's outlined in red here. The solid red is their path going out, and the dotted lines are their journey coming back to Antioch. If you're wondering, well, how long did this journey take? It took 18 months, and they traveled 1,400 miles. So all those different stops, doing all kinds of ministry that we're studying and learning so much from. It was tough terrain. They were in sandals, not Air Jordans. There were no restaurants. There were no hotels. But there were bandits to watch out for. There were fascinating people in different people groups. There's connection with people of all kinds of diversity. And we're learning how to connect with everybody. Everybody in the world, anybody who's different than us, as Jesus' people. And we're a part of these amazing things that Jesus did in their lives and will do through ours as well. So now in chapter 14, as we enter this next stage in their journey, again, they stand to fight for truth, of course, but we see some new twists, some new lessons, and we learn this principle that in ministry and in Christian life, just following Jesus, there are high highs and there are low lows. And we learn that, and probably we've all learned this through this experience, that this high and low cycle of life, the highs and lows are always with us. It's not just a common thing. It's a constant thing. It's the norm. There's always highs. There's always lows. But today, in chapter 14, by watching the witness and the work of the Holy Spirit through these two guys, we're going to learn how to master the high-low cycle of life. Does that sound good to anybody? To master this high-low cycle of life. That's what God has for us today. And we're going to begin with a key word that's the key for the rest of the book of Acts and a key word that must characterize our lives. That key word is endure. Endure means persevere, press on, keep going, keep standing, and keep getting back up again after you fall. There's no reason not to. We've got creator Jesus in us, this Holy Spirit working in us and through us. He's with us always, and he says, endure. And grace and forgiveness that is unending and inexhaustible. Please believe that. Don't ever listen to the devil's lie that you can't serve Jesus anymore because of what you did. Here are some scriptures written by the Apostle Paul later in the New Testament where he teaches this very thing, and he gets this lesson of endurance from what we're going to study today in Acts 14 and beyond. But here's what he writes. He writes to his, in his books, he says, Galatians 6, 9, And let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Oh, that's, a, that's a treasured verse right there. Keep going. You will reap if you do not give up. Elsewhere, Romans 5, 3, and 4, he writes, Not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces what? Suffering produces endurance. But endurance is not the end. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. So we embrace our sufferings and the highs and lows of life, producing endurance. That's a key word that's going to last us really throughout the, the whole rest of the book of Acts, throughout our whole lives. Keep enduring, brothers and sisters, in Christ. We're going to notice that in these verses throughout chapter 14 of Acts, our ability to endure anything that life throws at us, anything that Satan throws at us. We have total ability to endure it all, but that, endure, that ability does not come from within ourselves. And, and I'll tell you, if you are pulling from your own ability to stand against the face of anything, you will fail. We're not pulling this from our own ability, but rather what we're going to see right here, enduring we're going to see right here through the rest of this study of this chapter how to master the highs and lows of life and to endure. Okay, so let, join with me if you're keeping notes or just watching on the screen. The first thing as we enter the text that we learn is to endure, encourage in Jesus. We learn this from these two guys and from the promise of the word. We can have all courage, all boldness in Jesus. Without him, we get fearful again. So keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Remember that Paul and Barnabas had left a situation in Pisidian Antioch 
where the Jews from the synagogue attacked them and beat them up. They preached courageously, they were attacked, they were beaten, and then they were driven out. But did they stop? Did they get defeated? Did they go back home? Did they give up? No, they kept right on going. They endured, and we learn where the strength to endure attacks comes from. And this is letter A, depending on the Lord. Depending on the Lord, not on our own ability. Not on our own strength. Paul and Barnabas, driven out from the Jewish synagogue from one town, now arrive in Iconium. And if you were here last week, where do they first go in a new city if there is one? Where do they go? The synagogue, the Jewish synagogue. Very good. So now they enter Iconium, about 80 miles east of Antioch where they left. We see in chapter 14, verse 1, now at Iconium. We see a map here. We're getting more inland here. Um, we're off to the east. It's getting a bit more deserty. There's a picture from there today. Antioch was an agricultural and trade center. It had a lot of highways going throughout the Roman Empire there. It was a strategic place for them to go. Now they entered there together into the Jewish synagogue here. Remember, they got beat up at the last one. But that's right where they go in the next one. And they spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. That's great news. They went courageously there and praised God, and all those new believers will praise God that they had the courage to go there. And they preached fitting words to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah, and they can have salvation in him, and to the Greeks that God is the creator and real, and that Jesus has his arms out for you as well, not just the Jews. And a great number of people believed their preaching. That is good news. But if you've already gone on to verse 2, you, you'll see it doesn't end there. But, verse 2, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles, and this is strong language, poisoned their minds against the brothers. This is some heavy opposition here. People stirred up the minds, poisoned against them. So what are they going to do with this intense resistance? I mean, this is intense. They're getting called all kinds of stuff. And did they just give up? Verse 3, what they do? So they remain. I love these guys. They remain for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord. And the Lord now is the subject. The Lord who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hand. Where did their courage come from? Never is it attributed to any part of their own good character. It is because they're trusting and walking in the Lord and filled with his Holy Spirit. They spoke boldly in Jesus and for Jesus, and Jesus bore witness for them. Jesus is always with us. He promises that. Always ready to grant the, the power that we need. He granted them. If we are abiding with Jesus and walking with Jesus and loving Jesus and depending on Jesus, he will always provide what we need. Aren't we blessed by King Jesus? And so they did. They, they stood there, they preached, and they did signs and wonders. But, verse 4, they only had moderate results. Verse 4, but the people in the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews. And some sided with the apostles. And now we've got the face of persecution in this divided city. We know that Jesus is going to give us power for what we need. He's going to give them power for what they need. We know for sure he's going to give us power for what we need. But how do we know what we need? The good news is that power isn't just the only thing that God gives us. He also grants us something else that will allow us to endure all things for him, and that is, letter B, discerning. Jesus grants us discernment and wisdom. He's always with us. He's always working with us. He's always good. But then he gives us the discernment that we need to understand what we need to do. This is going to be on full display in the text as we go through it. Here's what happens. The city is divided. Some siding with the angry Jews, some siding with the apostles. And now we can see how easily a mob can be swayed from one side to another and become violent quickly. We see that all the time, in, in, even in our own country. 
Well, here's what it looked like then. Verse 5, when an attempt was made by both Jews and J Gentiles and Jews with the rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, that is, the mob took over, they learned of it and fled. And here's where discernment comes in. Because if you've been paying attention in Acts, sometimes Jesus' apostles will stand and they'll face whatever, stoning, beating, courageously. But sometimes, this isn't the first time we've seen this, they'll hear about that and they'll flee, they'll get out of it. How do you know what, which one's right? How do you know which one to do in any given situation? Should I stay? Should I go? And this is the discernment that we learn that Jesus gives us through his spirit and how to get it. The fact is, sometimes it's the best thing for us and for the gospel, this is the key thing, which is better for the gospel, for the reputation of Jesus, if I stay or if I go. And we're faced with that on a lot of things. Here, Bar Paul and Barnabas show us an example of what we can do. They certainly prayed because they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they were able to discern here that staying would do more harm than good, and that leaving would do more good than harm, and so they left. So maybe you are in a, in a season right now of choosing what to do. Should I stay? Should I go? Should I stay in this place or go? Should I or move? Should I stay in this house? Should I go? Should I stay involved in this ministry or should I leave? Should I stay involved in this relationship or should I leave? And here is how we answer this. What's the best for the gospel? What's the best for the witness of Jesus? Sometimes the right thing is to go. Sometimes the harder calling, but the right thing is to stay. What do we do? How do we know? Well, on your notes, you see this and on the screen. Here's how to know when to stay or leave. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. How does that come about? In total worship and surrender to God, being in his word, which is the main thing the Spirit speaks to us through, and in prayer and in obedience to God's word. And as you are earnestly seeking God's word for his will, you learn that God promises wisdom and discernment every time that we ask for it. Because James 1.5 says this. This is one of the most important verses, especially in our church leadership, and we pray this prayer often. But look at the promise of God here. James 1.5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. This is one of the few things that the Bible says that anytime we ask, God will always answer yes. We ask for wisdom, for discernment. God will say yes, I will give you discernment. Our elders pray this prayer a lot. I was thinking earlier, we really should be praying that every day, shouldn't we? We need wisdom for making the right decisions. We learn this in Scripture. Pray to Him, and He will give us that when we ask for it. But I know we Americans try to do it on our own power first. I'm, I fall in that same camp as well. But we don't want to just be Americans, that individual spirit. We want to be Christ followers first and have that relationship with Him. And ask. I'm getting better at it. I hope you are too. We're so blessed. So that's what they do. Why do they choose to stay in one case and to, and to leave in another case? It's because they're being led by the Spirit. So they learned of the plot to stone them, and they discerned they should leave. Verse 6 again. They learned of it and fled. And now God takes them to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Ly Lyconia, and to the surrounding country. So they did ministry in all the towns throughout the area. And they, there they continued to preach the gospel. So let's just catch up where they are right now. It's about 20 miles away from Iconium. You see Lystra there. It's a smaller town where everyone in the town were devoted to worshiping Zeus and Hermes. 
one archaeologist's discovery was a statue of Hermes, and the inscription said, dedicated to Zeus. And another inscription was on a city gate that said, Zeus before the town. So in the, in the Greek and Roman pantheon of gods, which were demonic, they worshipped these gods, and they had territorial gods. So in this territory, Zeus and Hermes were their patron gods. And this is fascinating, and I know a lot of mainstream culture has made Greek mythology popular again, and it's neat to study those things because that was the worldview where all of this is happening uh, once we get out of Jerusalem and Judea into pagan territory. So this is where the Lord, in the discernment that he granted, directs them, and here they are. And while they're there, he directs them to endure in another way. And this is main point number two. Endure in our commitment to Jesus. And this will carry us through to help us endure if we're committed to Jesus. Again, in Lystra, they're in complete uh, Greek and Roman pagan territory here. There are very few Jews, uh, and so there are no synagogues. I learned that in ancient tradition, if there are no more than 10 Jews in any place, then you have to have at least 10 Jews in a place to, to even have a synagogue. And so there must not be even 10 Jews there. There is no synagogue, and so they need a new strategy. Remember, because that was their strategy, they'd go right to the synagogue. They needed a different strategy. They don't have one established yet. This is their first missionary journey. This is their first really, truly pagan place. And they are learning. They're learning right along with They're not perfect. They're not Jesus. We idolize these biblical heroes sometimes, but the Bible points out their faults and their mistakes and their growth process, and here we're learning with them. We learn from experience and from mistakes, just like they did. So let's look at how they endured in their commitment to Jesus and what they learned. Here's the first way. Letter A is always improving. Always improving. Just like we are. We're always growing. We're always maturing. We're always learning from the mistakes that we make. Amen? Hopefully you're learning from them. I know we're making mistakes. We're learning from experiences that we have meeting other people. We're learning from uh, trying new things. All kinds of different ways to learn. And here we go. They learn. They're always improving. And here's what happens. Cool passage of Scripture, fascinating stuff that we find that we can apply to our lives. Verse 8 through 10. Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking. That means they didn't get to go to the synagogue because there wasn't one, so they're just out in the public square somewhere speaking. And this crippled man was there, and he was able to hear, and he listened. And Paul, looking intently at him, and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet! And he sprang up and began walking. There, he's preaching in the public square. This takes courage. He is enduring in courage. And here's another man that's appreciative. Now, did what I just read there, did what we just read together look familiar to anyone who's been going through this Acts series from the beginning? Have we seen that kind of thing before? Does anybody remember? Back in Acts chapter 4, the same kind of thing happened with Peter and John when they were going up to the temple to pray, and they were walking through the crowds, and they see a crippled man that was lame in his feet from birth. He looked at them, and they made eye contact. Peter and John healed him, and he and everybody marveled at that, and they proclaimed Jesus, and tons of people trusted Jesus. And that's how the gospel started exploding in Jerusalem and out to Judea, but now here we are to the ends of the earth, cross-cultural, in a new, a new society with different beliefs, Greek, Roman, pagan city, with a new apostle. Paul, and he does the same thing through Paul. The gospel's movement toward all nations is happening, and it's happening today. People are coming to Christ every day, thousands of them, every day, all around the world, in all kinds of different people groups, different customs, different religions. And it started right here. This is where it broke out, right here. 
And brothers and sisters from this church, Community Grace, or if you're visiting from any other faithful church, any faithful church will be mobilizing men, women, and children to be talking about Jesus everywhere they go to people that are different from us right here where we live. And it's why every faithful church will send and support missionaries to go cross-culturally. And so we're only going to be increasing in all of those things because of our commitment to Jesus. I pray that this history is our history and that it inspires us all to continue to rearrange our life's priorities for this very thing. But in this text, did you notice something missing? Paul makes a mistake. He leaves something out here that Peter and John did not leave out ever yet in the book of Acts and that Paul will never leave out again. He'll never make this mistake again. But he does so here. Let's go back and read verses 8 through 10 again and see if you can catch it. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet, and he was crippled from birth, and he had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and, he, and Paul looked intently at him, and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet! And he sprang up and began walking. What's missing from what Paul said to this man? Jesus. I hear a lot of people saying it. He did not proclaim the name of Jesus and that this was in the power of Jesus, for Jesus, anything like that. What we're learning in Acts, what we're learning here, is anytime we're doing good works for Jesus out there, we've got to say the name of Jesus. We've got to tell people, I'm doing this because of Jesus, what he's done for me. I'm doing this because of my commitment to him, because he's the good news. If we don't do that, no one will ever know that what we're doing good is for Jesus, and they'll look at us and say, wow, what a great guy Reg is. Thank you. What a great young lady Becky is. She's out there doing all that good. Oh, well, she's just wonderful. And they'll go and never hear about the eternal life-changing truth of King Jesus. Now, Maybe even we will like it and start liking the praises of other humans. And we can get, go down that road as well. God shows us that this will happen in this passage. Verses 11 through 13. Here's how they responded. Well, this is an amazing miracle. And when the crowds saw what Paul had done... When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lycanian, that's their native language that Paul and Barnabas didn't understand yet. They didn't understand what's going on here. They said, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. So here we have some statues, Zeus on the left and Hermes in the middle. And there's the temple of Zeus in Athens, Greece, that they've been able to preserve. You can just kind of see the temple to Zeus. This was a big deal. This was national religion. This was their faith. And they thought they were visited by Zeus and Hermes in the flesh. Verse 13, And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, man, he's excited. He's rushing out. Uh, and gets brought oxen and garlands. Can you, you know, he has to go say to the oxen herder, hey, we need oxen rounded up. He's got to tell the, uh, the royal plant nursery people, make some fancy garlands. Uh, we're going to go sacrifice to these two gods that are among us. This is, this is a big mess. Well, the good news is that God is so good and gracious. And I believe that, obviously, Paul and Barnabas are out there being faithful and standing courageously. They make, a, they make a little mistake. I think we do that kind of stuff all the time. And I have seen this in my own life and, and in lots of people over the years. Anytime we're trying to be faithful and talk about Jesus and stuff, um, not many of us are gifted with great eloquence and, and rhetoric to be able to convince someone that Jesus is worth listening to. I've called this over the years, hacking your way through. 
if you just hack your way through and say, ah, I love Jesus and I believe he loves me, or, I, you know, I'm doing this, this good work because of Jesus. That's where we start. We'll be always improving as we're faithful, as we learn more, as we have more experience, as we fail and receive God's inexhaustible grace. But his lesson for us today is to continue to endure in our commitment to Jesus and you'll grow, and you'll, and you'll grow through all of this and continue to improve. And then we get a next source of power for our endurance for Jesus. This is letter B here. Always compelled by the gospel. And we have to be like these men were in our commitment to Jesus and love for him, gratitude for his love for us. We have to be compelled by the gospel's tran transforming of my life, made me a whole new creation, and the need for everybody else to have the opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus. And we see an example in these two followers of Jesus so compelled by the lost condition of the people around them and so compelled by the gratitude that they have for Jesus, their Savior and Lord, so compelled that everyone should hear the gospel. The first thing they do and that we need to get good at is deflecting the glory from us to Jesus. This is the first thing they had to do. They were getting all the praise and worship, and they had to take care of that immediately. They think, now remember, they were talking in a different language, all the people, but when it finally sunk in, they said, oh my, they're worshiping us. And they don't even fall into the temptation of liking it. One commentator I read this week made a great observation here that speaks to us. If Satan cannot derail Christian witnesses with persecution... If you stand strong in the face of persecution, he will try praise. Too much persecution has destroyed many Christians, and too much praise has ruined many others. And so as we're out and about in the community, which we are, we're making co connections with the Chamber of Commerce and other things, and people could say, wow, you know, Reg and Steve, they should, we should invite him on our board, and Whatever, whatever the case may be, as you're out there doing good things for Jesus, the praise feels good. And we should be thanked when we do something good. But the idea is never to receive that as worship at all, but on it, right away deflect that glory to Jesus. But praise God. Praise God. Praise Jesus. Okay, so here's what we learn. Barnabas and Paul, they do that with an extreme sense of urgency and seriousness. Verse 14. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of this, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of like nature with you. This is exemplary. This is the, the intensity that we should deflect the glory from God. And I want you to always remember this. You're like a big mirror, and any time... We're tempted to, to receive the glory for anything. We say, oh, it's God, because God is the giver of all good things. God gave you everything good that you have. God gave you the calling and the ability to do the good thing that you did, and all the glory goes to him. Not to us, but to God be the glory. Amen? That's a good life commitment, life skill. Compelled by the gospel. The next thing they did is that we, that we need to get good at is now connecting with people, proclaiming the gospel for them. We made this point last week. If you were here last week, that was an exact, one of the main points. But last week, it was Paul and Barnabas talking to the Jews and how skillfully they connected with the Jews who had a basis of knowledge about a one true God, but they didn't know that Jesus was the Messiah. So they connected with them on a very personal and relevant uh, level and it was it was great. Now here they are in Roman town, Greek town. People that have no knowledge of one true living God, but they worship this pantheon of gods. And Paul and Barnabas are going to do it again, and we're going to see the flexibility that we need to have connecting differently with different kind of people. We talk to lots of different kind of people. This is a totally different approach in connecting with someone to share about Jesus. Let's check it out. Verse 15 continues, And we bring you, so they deflected the glory to Jesus, and we bring you good news. Everybody likes good news. I have good news for you. 
that you should turn from these vain things to a living God. Whatever it is you're worshiping other than God is vain. I have something way better for you, way better for you. It's the living God, and let me tell you about him. Now watch what he does here. Who made heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. The first thing he does, the first thing he calls Zeus and Hermes and all the idolatry, he calls those vain things. I have good news for you. What you're worshiping is vain. That's good news because I'm going to teach you, I'm going to introduce you to the living God. Now here he connects with them. The, why do I have the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them underlined here? Because in Greek mythology, this was the formula of the three realms of the cosmos that the Greek gods created and ruled. So he's using their language, their understanding to connect with them, connect right with their heart and their values. This is exemplary again. He wants these pagans to understand there is a living God and these truths about him that is good news. And then next, as we enter chapter, or verse 16, Paul answers an obvious question before they even ask it. The question is, if there's really only one living God and one creator, why haven't I heard him about him before? Why have we never heard about him? That's a good question, right? I'll hear a testimony from time to time. Maybe you have too of somebody who grew up even in America and never heard anybody talk about Jesus their whole entire lives. Yes, that happens in America a lot. Um, until someone does, and they're so grateful. But think about overseas and cross-cultural. Why? Why have people not heard about Jesus? It's good. So Paul answers this question. Pay attention to his answer. Verse 16. In past generations, he allowed all the nations, all the peoples, to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from the heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. This is a good explanation. It's what in apologetics is called the cosmological argument, and that is, look at the cosmos in creation, in every field of science, every discipline of science, everything that we can see and observe, it all proclaims that there is a creator. And everything that you have that is good has come from this living God cosmological argument. And it works for us as well in sharing the gospel with anybody. You could get, you know, whatever they know, if they know nothing about the Bible at all, and only Jesus' name as a cuss word, maybe, you can say, you know, where did everything come from, and why are we here? Well, let me just tell you. God created everything out of nothing, and that's why everything works. All these systems exist, and why all in nature we look and humans were created in his own image. That's why we're different than every other animal or insect or organism. There's something special about us, and we, we all long to know truth. We all have a soul that longs to know its creator. And you can connect with people. Okay. And, and he is good, and he is the provider of all good things. Romans chapter 1 goes further into it, saying that because of God's attributes are clearly seen in all nature, no one is excused for rejecting God. We know he's been there all along. But note also that Paul focuses on the goodness of God. Much of the world is animistic, which means they worship some kind of spirits or idols that have spirits attached to them that give them animistic life that kind of comes to life through the spirits. Much of the world today continues in that school of thought, and that is entirely based on fear. They live in fear of the evil spirits and work to appease the evil spirits so they don't torture them or do harm. Paul is painting an entirely contrasting picture with the living God who is good. This is good news. This is freedom, which we enjoy in Christ. We need to be so compelled by the gospel, which sets people free of, of everything as it has us, if you're thankful for it at all. In 
and you can know him too. Well, Paul's crash course in cosmology, again, was somewhat effective. Verse 18. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifices to them. Even with all these great words, they still wanted to offer sacrifices to him, but they're like, okay, well, Zeus and Hermes is asking us not to, um, so we won't. But maybe that caused some tension in the air because things get really intense right away next. And the next thing that we need to get good at is, number three, enduring all trials out of love for Jesus' gospel. Whatever happens, because of our love for Jesus, his love for us, we need to endure all trials. Guess what? Guess who showed up? The angry synagogue leaders from Antioch and Iconium, they had been tracking Paul and Barnabas down this whole time, and they found them. They found them here in Lystra. Verse 19, But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, again, how easily a violent mob can be formed. We still see that today. And they do. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. Get this. The people who just worshipped Paul and Barnabas as gods just hours before now get whipped up into a frenzy. They were disappointed. They didn't get the gods that they wanted, and they stoned him, and they thought they killed him. They thought he was dead. Where have we seen that kind of thing before, where a crowd goes from praise to an angry, violent, murderous mob in a short time? We see it in Jesus in Holy Week, from Palm Sunday to Crucifixion Friday. We need to be ready to endure Look what Paul does. The other believers went out, maybe to mourn his death, maybe to bury his body, but they realize he's still breathing. He's still alive. And they pick him up. He re starts regaining his strength and bleeding and bruised, no doubt. He looked up and said, please hide me, right? Is that what he said? No, look what he did. He gets up and enters the city. I love this guy. <laughs> not only that but Paul is going to return to Lystra three more times in the book of Acts we're going to see him go back there next week and then again in chapter 16 and then again in chapter 18 because he's so compelled by the gospel for Jesus to save these people who stoned him and he sees hope there he's not going to give up he's going to endure as we should can we do that? Can people really mistreat us in any given way? Yes, we can. Absolutely we can. We're compelled by the gospel of Jesus. Compelled by Jesus' love for us and love for these people. And we're indwelled by his Holy Spirit to endure on Jesus' mission. We can endure every trial. This was Paul's first encounter with extremely pagan people. He will have many more. But he was new. He learned some things. He made some mistakes. He definitely hit some conflict. He learned. He learned a lot. Paul had learned so much since 15 years before is when he trusted Christ on the road to Damascus, and then Jesus taught him in, in the desert, and then he was not mentioned for another 10 years, but he's grown now, and he's out on the calling that Jesus has for his life, and he continues to learn and continues to grow, just like all of us. We're always learning and growing. If we're following Jesus faithfully, increasing our capacity to be used by God. And at the bottom of your notes, note this con concluding statement right here. <clears throat> in ministry, and I just mean by that, any good work that we do for Jesus in the church, out in our communities, in anything we do for Jesus, there are high highs and low lows. But know this, 
faithful brethren, faithful followers of Christ, the highs always outweigh the lows. Yeah, people are, are really unpleasant to work with sometimes. And all kinds of nasty things can happen to you. But God is always faithful, and we're compelled by Jesus' gospel. You may get beat up, but to see souls saved because you just hacked your way through and said, uh, Jesus loves you, and that intrigues them and the Holy Spirit works through them. Or in your other ministry, you're, you're ministering to children or you're, you're seeing marriages restored. You're seeing people forgive each other. You're seeing people grow. You're seeing young disciples of Jesus grow into maturity. You see older veteran disciples of Jesus leading and pouring into young people. All these things that we see for Jesus, the highs far outweigh the, the lows because God is faithful. And when your own relationship with God grows, there's nothing like it. Stay faithful, endure. The lows are definitely tough, but the highs will always win them. Stay faithful because Jesus is always faithful to you. Amen? And that leads us to the next step. And the first thing I just wanted to word this right, is to commit to this. If you commit to knowing the gospel and knowing the people that you interact with, what people? Everyone. Everyone that you ever talk to. If you know the gospel well and how it changes your life and how important it is for other, others to hear it and to know Jesus as well, and then you get to know the people that you're talking to who at any given time, with the heart of Jesus to get to know them and to share Jesus' love with them, You'll get to know their backgrounds and their beliefs and their worldview and how you can introduce the concept that, no, there is a living God who is good and has given us his son, Jesus. Author John Stott wrote this, wherever we begin in any of our interactions, we shall end with Jesus Christ. Wherever we begin, whatever we're talking about at first, football or whatever, we shall end with Jesus Christ who is himself the good news and who can alone fulfill all human aspirations and longings. That's what people really want and need. And we can introduce them. Endure, brethren, in the hardships that we face, walking with Jesus, filled with his spirit, we can endure. And with his brothers and sisters in the church, it's a great provision that he's made us interdependent on. That's a personal challenge, to commit those things to Jesus. And then second, as a, as a church, we have our next opportunity to be out here doing this very thing together in our next Grace in Action event uh, out in our community. We've been announcing this, and it happens next Sunday afternoon, a week from today. Uh, this is great. The more, the merrier. There's plenty of room. We're going to take the last spot in the county fair parade uh, this is such a good idea. Pastor Steve has done this um, years ago in Michigan one time, and, and he arranged it, and they're glad to have us there. We'll be out there in our shirts, uh, showing Jesus love, telling people Jesus love them, connecting with people, throwing away all the trash, leaving the parade cleaner than it's ever been, and uh, there's plenty of room for all of us. So come on out, make sure you plan, and it would help if you sign up on our website or the church app, clicking calendar, the parade event. And, uh, and we'll be ready for that. It's good being Jesus' people, isn't it? Let's pray to him and, and return our worship and praise to him. <clears throat> Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in our lives, the truth. Thank you that everybody's here. I know some, some of us were up late at the fireworks last night, and it's so good to see all of them here this morning. Um, I, I mean, America is great, fireworks are great, but King Jesus, you are you are everything. And I thank you that we get this truth and this power that you're always with us. Your presence never leaves us or forsakes us in any moment. We do forsake you, though. We turn our eyes away from you. And for that, we thank you for your inexhaustible grace that we can always endure and get back up when we've fallen. I thank you, and I pray that we'll strengthen each other with these words as we sing in a unified voice of worship and praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>